Welcome everybody to Phoenix Books in Burlington on this beautiful summer evening. Um, my name is Todd, I'm the manager here at Phoenix Books Burlington, and we have a great, great show tonight. We've got Lev Grossman here, the author of the three book Magician series. The third book in the series, The Magician's Land, came out in paperwork just two weeks ago. I really, really, really love this series, and I loved it so much that I actually reread it backwards. For some strange reason, I started with the third book and read the second and then the first. And I don't know, it was really good to read it that way. I don't know why. It was really fun. I think because unlike a lot of series where sort of the second book is a kind of like a pause, uh, I really felt like this series got better with every single book. Um, and it was really amazing because I loved the first book so much. But by the time I got to the last book, I just... I think I stayed up way too late finishing the third book, and that's probably why I had to read it again, because I read it too fast the first time. So uh, we're here with Lev Grossman. Uh, we've got uh, Andrew Liptak here to be the interlocutor, if that's a word. Um, and uh, I don't want to take up too much of your time, so we're just going to hand it right over to these guys. Thank you so much for coming. I have questions. Good. You have answers? Let's do it. Okay. Um, now this seems silly that I have a list of questions. I should just launch into this. <laughs> what is your favorite color? <laughs> My favorite color. Uh, this was a, a, a this was a subject of enormous importance to me uh, when I was younger because I was obsessed with. Um, do you read the um, Piers Anthony the Split Infinity books? No. Am I the only person who has read the Split Infinity books? Yes. <laughs> it's a complicated <laughs> setup, but basically there were like, you know, these different adept wizards who uh, their whole identity was built around their color and you had to ally yourself with one another. Um, and I ended up with gray for some reason. So gray became my favorite color officially. Is that even a color? Gray? <laughs> <laughs> Gandalf the gray. Yeah. Piers Anthony is actually from around, uh, he actually came to school up here and studied. Is that right? Yeah, over in, uh, uh, I think, Goddard College over in Plainsfield. He studied for, I don't know what he studied, but he he, he uh, studied something. Uh, he's here a, for a while. I think he's an underrated writer. He was a huge influence on me. Okay. You're, you're going out of order. Mm. <laughs> that, that's Sorry. the third page. I haven't seen, you didn't show me the script. <laughs> um, actually, one of, the, one of the questions I did have is, is the Magicians clearly draws a lot from um, Chronicles of Narnia and uh, other sort of major fantasy works. Um, and you've also said that um, uh, Larry Niven's novels have played a, a, a role in your thinking here. What, what other books have you drawn in either consciously or subconsciously and that you either read as a child or read later on? Uh, well, uh, there's a lot. Um, uh, I, a lot, a lot, part of my sort of creative process, I feel like I run into two kinds of writers. One is the kind who, uh, w when they're writing, they don't, they don't read other fiction. They just, have to, they just look inside for them and they let their pure voice ring out on the page and they don't sully it with anybody else. And other people, it's like we're just like these horrible grave robbers who just <laughs> steal pieces of bodies and suture them together uh, to create their book. Uh, I'm more like the latter kind. So I feel like I'm, I've, I'm influenced by so, by so many different people um, in no particular order. Uh, Neil Stevenson was a big one for me. Uh, in particular, uh, Cryptonomicon, um, just for his style. You know, mm. I feel like he's an underrated stylist. Uh, he's so good and as good as any literary writer uh, who's working now. Um, Evelyn Waugh was a big one, which is something that people don't necessarily always get, um, just because it's slightly on to write a fantasy novel based on Brian's Hitter Visited. And yet, uh, that's mostly what I've done. I mean, much more, uh, uh, Break Bills, which is the school for sorcery in the books, um, uh, it's, 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 much, it's much more like Oxford uh, of, uh, from Brian's Hitter Visited. Um, uh, Oxford in the 20s, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, uh, this place, you know, which is just sort of s still kind of recovering from uh, the shock of World War I. Uh, and, you know, these characters have this wonderful, idyllic experiences with hints of future darkness to come. And then they go out into the world. Uh, they graduate and go out into the world. Um, and then all sorts of awful things happen to them. That whole structure, the, the sort of first half, the education, um, and then the second half, you know, what they've learned kind of encountering the world. 
Uh, that whole structure turned into the magicians. Okay. Um, uh, I borrowed so much from that. And uh, education seems to play a large role in a lot of fantasy novels. You have, uh, obviously, Harry Potter comes to mind. You know, yeah. they, they go off to magical school. And there's other, uh, there's other ones I'm escaping the names. The names are escaping me at the moment, but that seems like the, the, the training novel is a, is a sort of fantasy trope. For yeah, well, especially of late. I mean, the first inkling I had <coughs> of the magicians was when I reread Wizard of Earthsea by Ezra Le Guin, um, which was probably the first story about a school for wizards that I ever read. Um, and in, in, I, I reread it, I read it as a, as a kid and then rereading as an adult. I, my memory was that he'd spent, that the whole thing, like half, half the book took place on the island of Roke because those, that part was so vivid for me mm. when he was there and you know, getting schooled and everyone was doing spells and he was seeing the various mysterious masters. He's only there for like a chapter and a half. Um, and I actually have notes that I took from 1996 um, where I was saying, well, God, this, it's just the, it's the strongest part of the book. What if we had an entire book that was set at a school for wizards? What if you had seven books, all wizards? <laughs> right. And I was like, no, that's crazy talk. Uh, and Harry Potter came out the next year. Um, so I failed to monetize that very valuable idea. Yeah, she, she got in the door first. Um, but, you know, for me, it started with Le Guin. Um, uh, and since then, I mean, Patrick Rothfuss, the university. Um, so many, it's become such a, 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 a central trope of fantasy now, mm -hmm. um, this idea of education. Why do you think that is? I, you know, I've, 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 I've struggled to sort of figure out where it comes from, even in my own work. Uh, I mean, for me, you know, Breakbills, it's like a, it's like a fantasy of kind of, what I thought college was going to be before I actually went there <laughs> <laughs> and find out what it actually is. Um, uh, you know, this idea of being initiated into, into knowledge that makes you feel more powerful, gives you traction on the world around you, um, it's a fantasy of what education could be, and yet so rarely is. Mm. Let's step back for a second, and you mentioned that the first inklings of, of the magicians came from Ursula K. Le Guin's book. So wh where did you first meet Quentin? And how, what was that introduction like? Um, that was when I was 17 and looking in the mirror. <laughs> we made our <laughs> acquaintance at that time. Uh, Quentin is, is a, a, a slightly cruel caricature of what I was like when I was 17. Um, and you know, part of the thought experiment of, of the books was I mean, when I was 17, I was, I, was, um, I was kind of depressed. I was super, super obsessed with fantasy um, and science fiction. Um, I had no interest in the world around me um, at all. It seemed as though uh, everything important, everything good was happening somewhere else, possibly Narnia. I don't know where, possibly college. It didn't turn out to be college. Uh, <laughs> but you know, whatever was going on around me was automatically just dross. Uh, and what I was looking for was the, uh, you know, was the subtle knife, the thing that could take me through into the world that was in color, where everything was 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 exciting and, and interesting. Um, and you know, uh, I had, when I started the magicians, started writing them, uh, I was 35, but I still had a lot of Quentin in me. Um, and so I was playing with this idea of, of giving him what he wanted, uh, making his dearest wish come true, and then. Um, and going from there and kind of playing out what might have happened. This, what didn't quite ex turn out for him as much as, as well as he would have expected either. No. Is, is that how you found college to be, not as expected? Well, <laughs> well I, was, I was, part of what I was doing, I think, when I was running Magicians was exorcising that final, you know, that deeply held conviction that uh, it wasn't too late. I might still possibly get to go to Narnia. I, I, I feel like I was, I was just putting off things in my life uh, and just not paying attention to what was going around me. You know, why, why should I pay my quarterly estimated taxes? I'm going to Narnia very <laughs> soon. Uh, I was just kind of vamping my way through, at this point, my 30s. Uh, and I had to just sort of tune in and just set that aside, throw it away, exercise it or something. that. Uh, that, that fantasy that, that I was going to go somewhere else and my real life would begin, because uh, my life was half over. This is a very cathartic exercise for you then. Yeah, it was cathartic. Uh, I, had, I had to sort of work through, um, you know, Magicians is a, is a coming of age book, um, 
but it's also very much about what I went through in my 30s. I guess I came of age in my 30s. Right. I was a slow, slow learner. In that so, respect. what magical powers have you gained, and how do you do you use them for good? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Nothing at all. Uh, it turns out, yeah. Um, uh, uh, a lot of things are different from the way Piers Anthony described in the Xanth books. Did you ever hear about the, the case of where the kid obsessed with Piers Anthony and then actually ended up tracking him down to his house in Florida? Uh, no. I never heard of that. There's apparently at some point there's this kid who was really obsessed with Piers Anthony and he'd, he'd written him letters and they'd gotten, you know, they'd correspond a little bit and then he's decided, I don't like my family, I'm going to go live with Piers Anthony. As, as one does when you're like 12 or 13 or sure. so, and he basically gets on a bus and goes down to Florida and shows up at Piers Anthony's house, and Piers Anthony is very confused at this. Um, so, wow. I don't know. It's something I would have done with, with some of my favorite authors, I'm sure, if I had thought to do it. But. Yeah, no, that's incredibly plausible. I could completely <laughs> see why, why somebody would want to do that. And I, I guess he was, he was good about it. He said, oh, well, this is interesting, but we're going to call your parents and get you back home, and you don't have to deal with you. Um, your twin brother, Austin, is a, also a speculative fiction writer. Um, do you guys have the same sort of obsessions when you were kids? Did you read the same things, or were you separate? No, pretty much exactly the same. It's interesting reading... Uh, so am I talking to Austin right now? <laughs> You'll never know for sure. <laughs> Nothing I could tell you, um, you know, would be 100%. So tell me about your book, uh, Soon I'll Be Invincible, <laughs> and you. It's, it, it's, I find it fascinating reading his work um, because it does come out of that exact same kind of, the exact same the sort of cultural mulch that he grows it out of. This is like exactly the same. Mulch? Compost? Maybe it's compost. Mulch, mulch is fine. Cultural... Yeah. We're organic up here. <laughs> okay. It's exactly the same uh, as my stuff comes out of. So mm. when I look at his stuff, I can see him reworking all these things that we read, that we both read, because we read exactly the same things. Yeah, you in particular, not, not you, you, but you, the book. Uh, I told him it would be confusing to call a book you. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, who's on first? <laughs> um, I mean, when I was reading it, I was, I was seeing a lot of the same, similar things. It's a, it, you is about a... a kid who joins a computer company uh, or computer gaming company and it sort of goes through this this strange journey of these various computer games over the course of gaming history and it, a lot of the same sort of thing he's he's sort of put out in the world and doesn't quite know where to go so did you guys while you while you guys were writing your books did you talk at all or was there some sort of transference of thoughts or anything like that well it was it was it was um it was a touchy issue because, like a lot of twins, um, there's there's, an, there's a rivalrous element um, to our bond. It's a close bond, but but it, it uh, we're also co competitive with one another. Um, and coming out of college, he right away got a great job um, doing uh, video game design for um, a company in um, Cambridge, uh, which was great. Uh, and it took me a much longer time to got, find any kind of gainful employment. Um, during which, during which period, I wrote a couple of books. He wasn't writing books. He was doing mm -hmm. his video game thing. So when he decided, oh, you know, I'm going to really, I'm going to give it a go. I'm going to write a novel. I was just super condescending about it. And I was like, <laughs> that is so cute that you're doing that. I love that you think you're going to write a novel. I was so sure he would never finish. Uh, and actually, it was really, it was a, what, what happened was he wrote a, a book called Soon I'll Be Invincible, which is about superheroes and supervillains. Uh, and it's incredibly excellent. And one of the things that spurred me on to writing the magicians was he sent me the first sort of five or six chapters of that. Um, and it was so good. And I was so angry that it was good. <laughs> <laughs> it irritated me so much. Rage is a real powerful creative, you know, creative spur. Um, and, I, and I just, it, it made me think, okay, God, I have to get serious uh, and, and, uh, and write something you know, that I really love and that really sort of puts what I want to say on the page, which I didn't, even though I had published two books at that point, I didn't really feel that I had done. Um, and in some ways, he really showed me the way. He was taking all these comic books and superhero comics that we read as kids uh, and, you know, transmuting them into this um, amazing literary novel. Uh, and I thought, oh, I should do that. Mm -hmm. um, but I can't do superheroes because he did it. Uh, <laughs> Would you write about superheroes if given the chance? I wonder if I would. Uh, I was never as conversant um, in 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 that in that sort of um, genre as he was. He was always slightly more into comics uh, than me. But it was a big deal. I mean, Watchmen. Talk about and Watchmen is possibly you know the formative reading experience uh, I had. Um, 
just because it, you know it's this blueprint for writing in a genre, but also deeply, deeply questioning the basic assumptions and conventions of that genre. Um, that's what Watchmen does with um, uh, with uh, the whole with the whole superhero genre, not the movie, which is okay but not great, <laughs> uh, but the actual graphic novel uh, by Alan Moore. Uh, uh, that idea that you could make a genre, I mean, when they did that, they sort of attacked the most sacred conventions of superhero stories. And as a result, they told the greatest superhero story that I had ever read. Mm -hmm. um, I thought that was a great model. Uh, and in some ways, it was all that I was trying to do with The Magicians was, uh, again, get at some of the, 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 the founding assumptions uh, of the genre, question them, mess around with them, um, and, and see what that looks like. Go all out of order with my questions here, so I'm flipping back and <laughs> forth. Um, actually, one of the one of the things I had, I had thought to ask was, do you see the magicians as a, as in conversation with the rest of the fantasy genre, and do you think that genre is more than just a, a tool to help booksellers and confused customers? Oh, I think it's very much more. Um, uh, there's a sort of school of thought that is saying, oh well, you know, now we're in, it's it's the new millennium or whatever, and all the genres are blending together, um, literary fiction and science fiction and fantasy and mysteries and stuff like that. Um, I'm a big believer in the, in the, in the, in the, um, in, in the firm borders between them um, and uh, keeping track of, of what genre you're in and what genres you're, 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 you're crossbreeding. Um, I certainly see, you know, I certainly see the magicians in, as in conversation with things. Something Interesting started happening for me with fantasy in the mid '90s when George R. R. Martin started publishing um, *Song of Ice and Fire*, uh, of which the first book was *Game of Thrones*. Now we just call the whole series *Game of Thrones*, but it's supposed to be called *A Song of Ice and Fire*. Um, that even, even though George R. R. Martin is impossibly famous and successful now, I still think he's underrated. The, that book, *Game of Thrones*, the way that it took the epic tradition and just inverted it and just threw a bunch of grit into the gears. Uh, and made it feel real and urgent and important and uh, ambiguous, uh, again, in a way that it hadn't for years, if not decades. Mm -hmm. It was so transformative. Um, and that really, I, I started waking up to what fantasy could do. Um, and, and I think it was a lot more than had, had been done already. And I was far from the only one. Uh, American Gods by Neil Gaiman, um, it was 2001. Uh, Kelly Link's work, uh, Susanna Clark. Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, um, which is now also a miniseries. Uh, it's quite a good miniseries, too. Uh, that was the book, really, that uh, I, um, I mean, I, that came out in 2004. I read it, I put it down, I thought for a couple of weeks, and then I started writing the magicians. So it was really directly spurred by the work these people had done, um, just using fantasy to say things that they've never said before. So how do you think of, the, how, of, of books that have basically taken Martin's sort of mode and sort of continued with the darkness and the grittiness, like the sort of grimdark, that in genre speak, we, grimdark is this little subgenre of really gritty and really dark and really brooding heroes and hoods and angry and all that stuff. How, what, do you, what do you think of how that has sort of taken, they've sort of taken that, that um, stick and run with it. Yeah, well, you, I any mean. Any thoughts on that? I don't know. I, the, uh, it's Joe Abercrombie, so I guess, is the sort of. Yep quintessential grimdark writer. Uh, I'm a massive Joe Abercrombie fan. Much better known in England than here, but he's, he's like a superstar. His stuff is great. Um, and this may just be indicative of how emotionally disturbed I am, but I never thought his books were that grim. <laughs> or, or certainly not you know, grimmer than, um, than Martin's, which are pretty frickin' grim. Mm. Uh, uh, I love his books, but honestly, when I picked them up, I thought, oh, someone's writing like Fritz Lieber again. I didn't think anybody wrote like that anymore. Oh, okay. Uh, mm. So you think it's the, it had, what Martin was doing wasn't, wasn't new or anything? It, it's just sort of a resurrection of some older tropes, or is it a, a, well, mi a newer mix? Uh, it was a mix. I, they were, he had precursors, but for me, it, it was a radical break. Um, the idea that you would write a, a, a work of epic fantasy with a dwarf in it, but not a happy, you know, mining dwarf with a big beard like Gimli, uh, <laughs> but actually somebody who suffers from dwarfism. Uh, I mean, that alone, um, what an F you to the whole tradition. Uh, uh, I found it just amazing. Yeah. And what do you, th um, obviously we've, we've had the Game of Thrones, I'm sure most people here have watched it or are familiar with it. Um, Jonathan Strange, Mr. Norrell, all these really big, you know, fantasy is now sort of coming into it, 
in, is now mainstream. Yeah. And why do you think that is? It, 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 it's strange to me because uh, when I when I was a kid and I read a lot of fantasy, I really wasn't aware that there were that many other people who were interested in it. I thought it was something that I and my friends enjoyed because there was something wrong with us, and most people, <laughs> you know, wouldn't sully themselves with this stuff. Maybe, yeah, and, maybe and, there's something wrong with all of us that we're all starting <laughs> to enjoy it. <laughs> um, and then when I, I never would have believed that a fantasy series could be a massive multimedia global blockbuster franchise. Um, it would never have occurred to me. Um, but yeah, something has ha happened. I, I feel like it's the, there, there, there has been some shift where, you know, end of the 20th century, we were very invested in science fiction, Star Wars, Star Trek, The Matrix. Uh, and then, turn of the millennium, suddenly it became all about Harry Potter um, and Game of Thrones and uh, Twilight, uh, the Lord of the Rings movies came out. Suddenly fantasy became um, the way the, like, the great hive mind of pop culture started was, was, was thinking about things, um, which is very interesting to me. Uh, and I, to me, uh, my sort of pet theory about this is that it has something to do with uh, technology and the way technology is kind of invading and mediating our lives. Um, I think Lewis and Tolkien were very much reacting to um, the industrialization and electrification of the world. Um, and we also have lived through this period of huge technological transformation. And I wonder if our interest in fantasy is also a way for us to think about what's happened to us. You know, um, uh, just imagining a world where there isn't technology. I mean, that's such a fundamental idea for fantasy, subtracting technology from the world, um, which causes you then to remember what we gave up when we allowed technology to take over our world. Yeah, especially um, because world, um, Tolkien's works ca really came out of World War I and his experiences there. I mean, that was the first real industrialized war that you know, it was devastating. So I think that there was some, definitely some cues taken out of that. And I mean, the last couple of years, we've seen some fairly terrible things. Not as terrible as World War One, but still pretty grim. Yeah, I, we, I mean, we haven't gone through, yeah, anything is, is kind of strong with World War One, but it's incredibly pervasive. Yeah, um, and I mean, we see, I mean, like you just, you go onto Twitter and you can find scenes from the front lines of Syria. Um, so, you know, there, that, that's a, a pervasiveness that didn't exist then, but it does now. Yeah. A lot of strange stuff has happened to us, and I feel like fantasy is a good way of registering that. Yeah, we're, we're sort of on the darkest timeline right now, I think. Yeah. <laughs> what? Nobody get last of the community joke? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, and speaking of television series, we, you have a television series. What's that like? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I haven't got it. I mean, I haven't got it yet. I mean, I cashed, it's I, I cashed the check. But <laughs> the actual, the actual scene... <laughs> Series doesn't exist yet, uh, but yeah, this is a, this is a, this is a, a, a bizarre thing to me that sci-fi is making a TV series out of the magicians. Um, it's very strange. It's real through the looking glass stuff. Um, uh, I, I always hoped it would happen, and you know there was always a lot of interest in the books, but it's it's an expensive it's an expensive world to build. It went, it went through a, a lot of sort of development hell for a while. It's because I think Fox tried to pick it up. Yeah. Or they were thinking of it, and then it didn't go anywhere, and then... Yeah, go right and that to was the only one that was visible. There were like five or six of those behind okay. the scenes that uh, um, we will let remain behind the scenes. So you're, you're basically just you're holding your breath until you actually see it on the television, make well, sure it happens. Well, it, 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 it is now happening. This, you, you can't stop it. It's already, it's like, <laughs> it's, 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 um, it's slouching towards Vancouver, I guess, which is where they're shooting it. Is, is, it, is it actually shooting now? It will shoot. It's going to start shooting soon. It'll, I guess it'll start in July. Um, but uh, as convinced as I was that it, this was a fever hallucination of mine, um, I, I went, they shot the pilot in December, which is they shoot the pilot first. Um, sometimes they do this. They shoot the pilot first, and then they show it to the network, and the network decides, is this going to be, is this worth you know, spending a lot of money on? Um, and they decided yes. But I, I visited the set where they were shooting the pilot, and it, it still seemed like an elaborate prank, and I was <laughs> I was walking up to the, the to the um, you know whatever the lot what is the Hollywood the lot you shoot it on a lot mm -hmm. I don't know I have to get my Hollywood like lingo um, and I and I and the first thing I saw was this uh, there, was a, there was a big empty lot surrounded by chain link fence and it had a sign that said magicians parking lot 
And I was like, oh my god, we have a parking lot. <laughs> Our own parking lot. This is really, <laughs> this is really real. Um, so it's all happening. I, you know, it, it, is, it is being done by other people. I look over their shoulder. Um, occasionally I write strident 10,000 word emails, which they almost certainly don't read. Uh, but you know, it's 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 really interesting what they're doing. It's their thing. So in, in some ways, I'm just I'm watching like everybody else to see what form it ultimately it's going to take. So have you seen the pilot yet? Have you actually watched? I've, the I've bit? seen the pilot. Yeah. I mean, without finished effects or anything like sure. that. Sure. Um, what did you think? I think they they've done some very good stuff. I mean, it, not to get too, too too sort of insidery, but if you've read the books, so the first book belongs to Quentin. The second book, a lot of it belongs to Julia. Um, they are. Going to, they're going to smoosh those together and tell the Quentin and Julia stories in parallel, oh. which I think is a good idea because Julia is a nice counterweight to Quentin. And frankly, if I'd thought of her in the first book, I probably would have done it that way, but I didn't think of her until the second book. <laughs> uh, she, I, she, she was supposed to, 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 to have the, be in the first scene of the book and then never reappear, and yet she kept popping up in this funny way. Uh, um, anyway, so I thought that was a good idea. The guy they've got to play Quentin is, is, is truly great, and they went through a lot of Quentins, and I kind of thought this isn't going to work because we don't have the guy. And then they found the guy who somehow projects like Quentinness in this amazing mm -hmm. way. Uh, I don't know, it's fun. they're really smart, they're, in, they're super into what they're doing. Um, telling stories on TV is not like telling stories in a book, as it turns out. Like you can't, you know, with the with the novel, you know, you you have the luxury of saving like a big reveal for for two thirds of the way through the book, um, which I do, uh, but you can't save a big reveal for for season five. You, you know, you've got to the you, the reveal comes in the pilot because people have to see and get invest see it and get invested in the world, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, so are they going to stick really close to the books and go through a couple seasons all the way to adapt books one, two, and three, or are they going to? sort of play in their own playground and see where it takes them? Or do you know? Uh, it's somewhere b between those two. It, mm -hmm. will not be, it will not be a, a scene-by-scene scene sure. um, kind of adaptation. Uh, I don't think it will be less close than, for example, um, the Game of Thrones books. Uh, the Game of Thrones shows have been. It will be less literal than that. Are you um, prepared for all your fans to send you angry emails saying, why did they change this? <laughs> I'm <laughs> I'm resigned I'm resigned to that. There's already a lot of heat around Janet, who is no longer named Janet. She's been renamed Margot. Um, I, I, not, the studios were like, "There's too many names that start with J. Get us a non-J name." I don't know where Margot came from, um, but I'm already getting heat about that. <laughs> I know I know um, one of the sister shows that you'll have, uh, The Expanse. Yeah. Um, they've had to make some changes and. Um, there's a, a group of characters called Belters, which are physiologically different humans. They have larger heads, they're very tall and thin, and they basically said, we don't have people that look like that. Right. And so they've, and there have been people who have been sort of upset about this thing, like, you know, it's, it's, you know, there's actually some, there's some racial elements that go on with it, and there, people have been upset. So they, they basically had to come out and say, you know, look, we got the best actors we can, and when we sort of change our standards a little bit, we get a lot more better actors. So that's where they sort of came with that. So I suspect you'll have some similar things. I think so, way. yeah. The guy they got to play Penny. Penny's supposed to be like doughy. Yeah. He's supposed to be not a magnificent specimen of manhood. <laughs> the guy that they got to play him is so good looking. <laughs> He's like an Adonis. It's going to be the Penny show, basically. <laughs> Other characters will occasionally get to say something. So do you, do you have the characters as you've seen them line up with what you had in your head, or are they different, or somewhere in between? Some yes, some no. Um, Elliot looks a lot like Elliot. Um, uh, and then some, not at all. But uh, you know, I've, I've, I've really sort of, I've, I've, I've given it over to them, and, and it's their thing, um, which was difficult. But I've sort of, I've, I've got to that place where I could just watch what they do. I mean, these guys have made a lot of TV shows. They're mm. like, they're not uh, making it up as they go along. They have a definite idea of what they're doing. So and this will be out 2016, right? I think so. Yeah, they're filming 12 episodes, uh, starting in July. I think it's going to be early next year. Cool. Excited. Yeah, I am actually. I'm really excited. I'm looking forward to seeing it. I, in the, they it released a, like a teaser trailer, uh, mm -hmm. and the effects look r really good. Uh, the magic looks looked super magical. Right. I really got. I started getting stoked when I saw it. Yeah. <laughs> so, and, and what, what what's exciting for me is that the Sci Fi Channel potentially has The Expanse by James S. A. Corey, uh, your books, uh, John Scalzi's Old Man's War, right, and 
I want to say they have another adaptation that they've got. Where, oh, Children of Men. Uh, sorry, Childhood End. Childhood End. Yeah. Arthur C. Clarke, which you know, so it's basically going to be a sci-fi show, uh, sci-fi channel once again. It's actually real science fiction. The, the <laughs> whole leadership of sci-fi I, apparently was like it, they they decapitated the leadership and brought in whole new management. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, this slate of shows is was like the first things that the new people did. Yeah. And I think they, they've just started with a couple new ones, which are you know pure pulp space opera, which are quite a lot of fun if you haven't seen them. So, um, next question. Um, answer that one. Uh, answer that one. Um, <laughs> let's talk about the women in, in the magicians. You mentioned Julia had been you'd sort of intended her to be a first you know appear in one scene and then leave, and then uh, she keeps popping up. Yeah. And I, one of the things I've, I've when I've Talk to other people who've read *The Magicians* or and read other reviews. There's been some criticism about how you tr have treated them, uh, Julia in *The Magician King*, and then um, Alice in the first book, and then sort of the third book. Yeah. How, how is that? What is that? Uh, I guess what has that criticism been like as you've been writing an ongoing series, or have you noticed it? Um, well, I mean, I've noticed it. Uh, uh, I, it's sort of hard to explain the dialogue between. I mean. We're we're writing in a weird time where, um, as you write, you're you're on an hourly basis uh, getting a ton of feedback coming back at you, which is a way that this is uh, novels are written in this environment that's totally different from the way they were written, you know, even ten years ago. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so you constantly have people um, telling you how they're reacting to what you're doing and telling you what they want. Um, it's interesting. Um, I don't quite buy. Uh, the argument that um, that the female characters in the books get get treated badly. I don't know if I quite buy that. Um, but you know, there are terrible things that happen to virtually all the characters, um, and they happen to the women and the men. Um, uh, we, we can go into sp specifics if you like. Um, I don't know how many how much people have read or if there's any new time readers. I'm seeing some people nodding, some people no. Nah. So I guess all right. So I guess Julia's sort of ordeal throughout her book. You, she has this uh, in the second book, uh, which culminates in basically her, a pretty horrific attack. I guess how what has the reaction been like for that? And I guess why did you choose to do it that way? Well, um, uh, I mean, I'm sort of we're getting a little spoilery here. Um, but there's but before a, nodding. There's a, a there's, there's a truly terrible act of sexual violence that happens towards the end of the Magician King, um, which is something I thought about a lot um, before I wrote it. Um, uh, well, what happens is you know Julia's part of a group of magicians who make contact with what are in essential uh, essentially gods, mm -hmm. and you know I've tried to be guided in the books by my sense uh, of what would happen. Um, and when gods and mortals, in, you know, it is, it is prevalent throughout all, all the mythological literature that when gods and mortals get mixed up together, gods often rape the mortal women. This is a thing that happens over and over and over again. And moreover, it is presented in a way that is kind of normative. Uh, you know, when, when Apollo, uh, uh, you know, chases after, is it Daphne, I guess, it wants to rape her, she gets turned into a tree, everyone sort of, Oh well, what are you going to do, with gods? Uh, uh, and I wanted to re-describe that and kind of re-inscribe it and say, wait, this isn't this isn't a, a, a merry lark on the part of those rascally gods. This is horror, and I wanted to rewrite that story as horror because I had seen it, seen it too many times written uh, in such a way in a way that implied that it was okay. Uh, so I felt as though it was it, that is what would have happened, and I felt like I had something to say about it. Um, and I thought I could walk away from this and write, write a book as if there is no such thing as sexual violence. You know, we could just sort of stick our heads in the sand. But I didn't think that was the honest thing to do. I thought it would, I would have lacked integrity, uh, and I didn't do it. Uh, it's, 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 I, I will never write another scene like that uh, in my career. I can I can say that right now. Um, but I did feel like it had to be written. Mm -hmm. and there's a sense that when your characters go over to the fantasy worlds, that the fantasy world is is more weird and more horrible than what they had imagined. Quentin had read the Fillory novels and had this idea that you know there's going to be bunnies and um, you know uh, uh, is it the 
the horse, um, the, cozy the cozy horse. Cozy horse. And you know, the, the, he would go off and have these magical adventures, and what he finds is that it's really a, a horrific place, and there's some really terrible things that happen to them all. And I, and the Chatwins also sort of discover they go up. You know, one, at least one of them goes off the deep end. In fairness, there are bunnies. There are bunnies. bunnies. <laughs> the bunnies were real. It's just that they left out a lot of other the other stuff. Um, well, you know, uh, it it all that started for me a little bit with. Um, uh, I love Harry Potter. I'm a huge Harry Potter fan. Um, I, I, I am almost positive that I've been to more Harry Potter conventions than anybody here, except for Joanna. Um, uh, but I always, I, always, I always sort of was vexed a little bit by the fact that Harry wasn't a reader. Uh, I always thought, uh, well, uh, Harry's locked in a closet, spends the first 11, 12 years of his life, locked in a closet in the, in the house of his uh, um, abusive host family. Um, what is he doing in there? If it were me, I would have been reading the Chronicles of Narnia over and over and over again, which I did anyway. There's no light. Even though I was locked in the closet. He is light. <laughs> crack, crack the door open. Uh, uh, but he doesn't read novels because that's just something rolling. I, for very good reasons, wasn't sort of that interested in it. Um, but I thought, uh, what if you had a fantasy novel that had fiction in it? There's almost no fiction in the Hogwarts library. As far as I can tell, Beetle the Bard is the only one I know about. Um, but what if you had a fantasy, I, I feel like if there was really a school for magic, the people who went there, a lot of them would probably be huge fantasy nerds already mm -hmm. and have read all these fantasy novels to the point where they, when they got there, they kind of imagined themselves to be the heroes of a fantasy novel. When they discovered that magic was real, they, uh, uh, certainly Quentin arrived at, at, at Breakbills thinking, this is fantastic, I'm the hero of a fantasy novel, it's going to be just like what I read. And of course, he has to undergo this difficult education where he learns what the difference is between fiction and reality uh, and stories and real life. Why, are, why is reality so much more poorly organized than stories? Why is it so much <laughs> less satisfying and consistently compelling? It, it was a hard lesson for me to learn when I was a, when I was a kid, also an, an adult. Uh, and it's something Quentin has to learn, too. Uh, and that's something, it's part of what he learns in Fillory. He goes there, and it's, it's, it's not like a novel. Um, it, 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 is, it is a magical place, uh, but it is much more complex complex and chaotic than um, uh, he's been led to believe. There's a real meta quality to the books as well. And I'm assuming it's deliberate. Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I, I, didn't want to go, I, I didn't want to be cute. Um, you, can, you can write a meta novel which is so meta that it feels kind of airless. And, uh, you know, it's all about how it's just a fiction. Um, I, I, didn't, I, I was determined to, to stay on the right side of that tipping point. Um, but there is that, for those who are interested in it, there is that little meta thread running through it where you're thinking about fantasy and fantasy novels and why uh, we all, myself very much included, find them so compelling. Um, so how do, you, how do you define, with that in mind, how do you define fantasy? Like if, if you've written a book that sort of takes some of the tropes and plays with them, how, what, what is, for, to you, what is fantasy? Uh, that's a terrible question. <laughs> but I'm asking the questions. I mean, it's so. a conventional answer, which is that uh, f fantasy is, is, is literature in which impossible things happen. Um, uh, I've seen that trotted out many times. Mm -hmm. For me, fantasy is much more about a set of conventions and, and tropes. This is one reason I like my boundary, my genre boundaries, to be clear, because I like to know which conventions and tropes are being invoked, um, and and which means that people have expectations for what's going to happen, and then you can flummox those expectations, which is sort of fun and exciting. Um, for me, fantasy, it's, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a, in part a set of tropes. Um, you know, you, you know you're going to get a story about somebody who um, is going on some version of the hero's journey, journey who's going to discover that he has power or, or she that, that he or she didn't know that they have. I'm getting in trouble with the pronouns. Um, you're gonna, they're going to discover that they have power that they didn't know that they had. Um, mm -hmm. They're going to find out, to find, they're going to find their way somewhere that nobody else knows exists. Um, you know, those, those, those tropes, which I love so much, are a big part of what, what, what fantasy is. Fantasy is about um, a world where, uh, from which technology has been deleted, largely, um, and therefore, you know, we exist in this way, which is very unmediated. You know, in a fantasy novel, to check the weather, people don't look at their phones to see what the weather is. They look up at the sky to see what the weather is. You know, you're, you're connected to the world around you, and you're paying attention to it in a way that, um, you know, technology kind of messes up. 
you know, Max Gladstone, um, I know we, we met, met a couple years ago at Re ReaderCon, he, had, he was bringing out the cell phone metaphor quite a bit and was saying that, you know, well, in some cases, you know, the, the cell phone, it is magic because you don't know how it works. Yeah. And so there's that sort of that other theory, I guess. So it's, it's sort of beyond comprehension. I know Arthur C. Clarke sort of had some things to say about that. Yes, he did. Um, that's not, yeah, my relationship to technology is, is, is very different. Um, uh, it, but it's, I, I feel sort of alienated from it. I mean, what magic is in part, um, uh, is, granted it is inexplicable, but it's in a weird way, when you're in a magical world, you feel connected to that world uh, mm -hmm. in a way that, that sort of doesn't happen in reality. Um, I'll jump a little bit. Um, and your parents were your parents were literature professors, correct? That's right. Yeah. Um, and so, in, in talking with you and, and and seeing some of the other interviews that you've had done, you've got a fairly considerable literary background. At least you, you know a lot about the the works of genre literature and, and things like that. How how did they in, influence you in sort of approaching books as art or as this series of conventions that follow one another? Well, in, in good in good and bad ways. Um, uh, my parents were both English professors. My dad taught at Brandeis for about 40 years, and then Johns Hopkins. Um, uh, my mom taught at Irvine and Johns Hopkins and Smith. Um, they were really people who, about their lives were all about books. They, uh, they were really, it was, great, it was great to grow up in a house where um, books were in their proper place. They were venerated. Everybody, you know, it was, you were given to understand that writing and reading were activities of enormous value. Which was great, um, and one of the things that, uh, if there's something that, that 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 sets my my fantasy apart, is that it's very strongly inflected by stuff by non-fantasy influences. Because just because I've read a lot of in the history of the novel, I went to grad school for a few years um, in comparative literature, um, and I draw on a lot of stuff outside of uh, uh, fantasy and kind of smuggle it over the border into fantasy in ways that that I don't know I fi I, I find exciting. Um, uh, you know, that said, I came to writing fantasy very late. Uh, I had been writing for about 15 years before I ever wrote a sentence in which somebody cast a spell. Uh, and I think it's because it, was, it took me a long time for me to really understand that that's, that was what my voice was. That's where my voice was going to come out because I was really trying to write, you know, novels like Zadie Smith type novels and Jonathan Franzen type novels. Uh, and uh, I did, and they, they weren't that great. Um, uh, I think when you grow up in a house with some very with a lot of very powerful literary voices, it can take you a while to, find, to, 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 to to start hearing your own. And it took me a long time. Do you think it's important to write outside of genre before attempting it, or or as using or t bringing in those influences that are outside of this sort of closed circle community? I think it's good to read outside the genre. Sure. Um, I mean, you know, reading Virginia Woolf is great discipline. You will never write like Virginia Woolf because Virginia Woolf is the all-time great. Um, but you can certainly learn a lot um, from reading her. Um, yeah, so that's about my last one. I guess the one last question I had is what genre literature are you most excited about that's come out recently? That you, what, what's sort of peaked on your radar? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, uh, I, met, I, I, mentioned, I mentioned Joe Abercrombie. Um, uh, I think he's fantastic. You just check him out if you haven't. I think The Heroes is probably one of my favorite fantasy novels from the past few years. Kelly Link, uh, <coughs> I mentioned before. All fantasy novelists that I have ever read are obsessed with Kelly Link, and they read her and study her in an attempt to understand how she does what she does, and we n none of us have ever understood it. Uh, she's just a genius. Um, her book, Get in Trouble, came out this spring. Uh, that was amazing. Um, yeah, I'm sort of blanking uh, after that. Um, uh, I'll come back to that. Okay. Um, I guess we can take questions. People with the best, they've got two copies of a highly anticipated science fiction novel. The best questions will get a copy. Or we'll, I don't know, we'll, you, can pick, you can pick the winners. So okay. whoever, whoever asks me questions. Uh, this won't be the best question, but it finishes up what you asked about your parents. And, um, from what you just said and what I heard you say on NPR a while back, you, you, you um, suggested that they look down on fantasy and science fiction as somewhat lesser, um, lesser entities within literature. So I just wondered, uh, you know, now that you found your voice and had this great success, uh, have they read the books and what do they think of them? <laughs> uh, 
Well, uh, <laughs> my mom's read the uh, has read has read the books. She read them in manuscript. We talked about them. Uh, yeah, she and I, you know, really we came to an understanding. I think about <laughs> about this um, disreputable habit I have. Um, my dad my dad died last year. We never really talked about the books. Uh, I don't think we ever talked about the books. I think that it was not something that was going to enter into his worldview. Uh, um, it was something we just kind of talked around. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a strange thing. But, you know, I think it was one of the things that made fantasy exciting to me was it felt so forbidden. <laughs> <laughs> it's a sad thing for a man to admit that, you know, his adolescent rebellion took the form of writing a fantasy novel when he was <laughs> 35 years old. <laughs> but there was an element of that. There really was. I felt like I was breaking rules. It was very energizing. I was thinking, I, I th sort of thought about when I, I reread re The Magicians last year and The, the Magician King and Magi Magician's Land, and, and Quinn sort of goes through this adolescent journey. He sort of starts off sort of a perpetual adolescent, and then he's sort of continu he continues to grow over the course of the books. Is that, was that a deliberate sort of path for him that you chose ahead of time, or was it just sort of, was he figuring, out, figuring it out as, as you were? Uh, a, bit of, a bit of both. I think one of the reasons I wrote the books was to try to figure out some questions about my own life. <coughs> that overlap with his. Okay. Yeah, I was just wondering if you were, the ideas were still percolating and you're thinking about writing more along those lines and if you're gonna keep ahead of the show. <laughs> <laughs> um, for now, uh, I, I'm out of the magician's universe for now. Uh, I, I spend about, I, the, I, I write slowly. I started writing the magicians in 2004, I think I mentioned. Um, and uh, so I spent about 10 years just writing in that world. Uh, and I'm going to take some time away from it. I may come back to it, but um, I'm not sure what form that return would, would take. I always think about how Ursula Le Guin came back to the Earthsea mm -hmm. books like 20 years after the third one. Um, and she had, this, she had all kinds of radical ideas uh, that were different from what she had before. I might have to like evolve personally in that way <laughs> before I return to the books. Uh, but I'm writing something new, and it's it's uh, it's also fantasy, but it, it's a different uh, kind of varietal of fantasy. Consider using the magician's parking lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's some real potential. Right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. On a similar note, would you ever consider writing the Fillory novels, and why or why not? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know. Uh, it's funny, um, I'm reading out, uh, no, actually, I, I'm not allowed to talk about that. Um, but I do know, well, sorry, I'm going to start over. Uh, you didn't hear I, I forgot that. that I'd signed an NDA about something. Um, uh, I wrote the first chapter of the first Fillory book, um, The World and the Walls, uh, and I plotted out the rest of them, basically because I was becoming confused about which chat when child had gone into Fillory at what time. Um, and the continuity was getting all scrambled. Uh, I don't know. I don't know that I would necessarily. Uh, um, part of what we know, because of some of the things we know about Fillory, um, uh, uh, I feel like I'd have to sort of step backwards and take a deliberately naive view of Fillory, um, uh, uh, which I think would be hard for me to do. Um, I love the idea of writing middle grade stuff. I have, I have three kids, um, uh, and I'd love to write stuff for them. Um, and they're not allowed to read the Fillory books, uh, the magician's books, until they're 37. <laughs> <laughs> they're just not ready. Um, um, yeah, but I don't think they would be that. They'd be something, something else. Um, so first of all, I'm super jazzed to be here. Um, I just started reading the books last week. And then um, yesterday, I was like, oh, I'm just going to see if there's like people geeking out online about like the Fillory books on his website. And I saw you were coming here. So um, I'm just super jazzed. Cool. And I'm in the, I'm in the middle of um, Magician's Land. And I'm just freaking out. Can't wait. <laughs> uh, can't wait to finish. Um, but there's a, there's, a, there's a great moment in the third, in the third book where Elliot is um, fighting a battle, and there are um, fairies that come, and you use the term like, they just kind of came to, they just showed up just for the lulls. <laughs> and I loved that moment because it, um, you know, there's all of this like sense of 
like magical like nostalgia of like you know break bills like how um, how like you know austere and wonderful it is and then there's like fairies that do stuff just for the lulls so I'm just curious about um, your thoughts on balancing that um, that like deep rich magical like formal language and then you know and then that kind of new slang yeah I fought a real war over that word lulls <laughs> <laughs> my editor wanted it wanted it out uh, copy editor wanted it out my wife wanted it out nobody wanted to have the lulls in there but uh, I don't it, it seems I never get tired of inserting language in fantasy novels that doesn't belong there. Um, uh, also, I thought, you know, well, uh, it, 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 fairies, I think, if they were real, would be a, a little bit like 4chan. Like, they really wouldn't care about our feelings at all. <laughs> Sometimes it would amuse them to toy with us. Uh, uh, you know, there's so, little, uh, there's so much humorless fantasy out there. Um, uh, and I just can't keep a straight face for that long. Um, I feel like if I, for every bit of like high flown fantasy talk that I put in, um, there has to be something like that, or you know, a reference to the Venture Brothers or something. Um, uh, yeah, it, it was an interesting moment where I really felt as though uh, I, I, I was making a decision about what kind of writer I was. Uh, um, I was warned that, the, that 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 slang would date badly, and in ten years it will just be like, oh my god. <laughs> so twenty teens or whatever. Um, so we'll see if that happens. But for now, I'm I'm really enjoying it. That's when you release the definitive author's edition. <laughs> yeah. Excise it. Well, I'm glad you put it in. Thank you. Uh, I just want to. Oh, sorry. Uh, what uh, fiction or uh, fantasy book would you recommend? Pretty much everyone to read. Oh, I I always go around um, uh, selling people on. Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, uh, which was, uh, I mean, I could sell people on Game of Thrones, but everybody's read Game of Thrones. Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, that was the first time I read a book where I thought, wow, this book does everything that literary fiction does. It's, it's, it's funny, it's weird, it's smart, it's, it's, it's strange, it's surprising, and it does all the fantasy stuff too. Like, you can actually have it all. Uh, she's just no limit to what she can do with language. Uh, I, I, that is the book that I, that I press on people. I have, I would say, about a 65% success rate with it. Uh, it. It is a long book, and not everybody I give it, who I give it to finishes it. Um, but since you asked, that is the one. And it has footnotes. It Lots has footnotes. footnotes. Yeah. yeah, it does. So I just want to say that I really enjoy your female characters, and especially Alice, who I think is far superior to Quentin. <laughs> <laughs> Just to balance your criticism with that observation, but um, I think that in particular, she, um, he, he reminds me of sort of Holden Caulfield, this, uh, this lost soul. Like I just, kept, when you were talking about literary influences, I was thinking J.E. Salinger. Yeah, no, that's a real one, yeah. Quentin Quint Compton. Yeah. Um, that that you, you caught me. That when <laughs> it's stolen from Sound of Fury. Uh, they have a, they have a lot in common. Um, Quentin certainly shares your opinion of Alice as being better than he is in almost any possible way. But I also want to say that we um, we had to paint the exterior of our house last year, and we listened to your audio version of that. And that the Mark Bromwell, yeah. he is a spectacular narrator. I thought he really did a, such a fine job with that. I'm so happy when I hear that. Yeah. Uh, this is incredible. It really helps me to life. You know, it's, it's, it's one of those weird sort of inside baseball things, but I've never met him. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, and I've always wanted to. Because, um, yeah, he He's British, really awesome. right? And he does a phenomenal mm -hmm. Quentin. But every now and then he says funny words like, instead of click, he'll say click, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but he's, he's a wonderful, wonderful reader. Yeah, there is definitely a reason to stop him. So I actually uh, have often described your books as uh, Holden Caulfield goes to Hogwarts, <laughs> and was wondering, like, were you deliberately trying to create a sort of typical outsider character that almost everybody in this room probably has believed they were at one point or another? Like, and if so, did that come from anything outside it other than your own experience? Um, only that uh, I felt as though. Um, I guess only to the extent that I wanted to write a bit about depression, 
Um, I feel as though fantasy has a lot to say about depression and a lot to do with depression. But uh, you rarely see somebody uh, with a, an actual plausible case of clinical depression in fantasy. Um, and uh, I wanted somebody like that, somebody who really, um, uh, who really was going to have trouble getting out of bed in the morning. Uh, I, wanted, I wanted to explore that just because uh, I've had difficulty with depression. And when, when, when one has, when, uh, uh, when one's in that state where it's, it's just, you feel you're lying in bed and it's just like, the idea of getting out of bed, of going to work. You look out the window, and you're seeing all these people walking around, talking to each other, and buying things, and going to work. And you think, God, I could never do that. I could never do that. Uh, it seems like they're doing magic. It's like they're doing impossible things. And then when you start to come out of it, and you can get up, you start getting up again, and going back into like the world of humanity, it's like you've become a magician. You've become, you've, you had no power, and then you've gained power again. Uh, I think some of Quentin's learning magic was about that. When I when I read uh, Catcher in the Rye, I hated Holden Caulfield. Interesting. But I really identified with Quentin. That is interesting. Yeah. I liked Holden. I did. Um, that's interesting. I couldn't stand it. <laughs> it's not him. objectively a good person. <laughs> um, would you say that Julia is a type of foil character to Quentin and that he would have taken a very different path if he hadn't have gotten accepted into break bills? Uh, I don't know what the answer to that is exactly. If Quentin hadn't gotten into break bills, Quentin would never, uh, that would have been it for Quentin. Uh, he would never would have seen any magic at all. Because uh, he, he didn't have the, the, the guts of the toughness that Julia had. Um, she's certainly a, a powerful, Counterweight to to Quentin, um, uh, tougher and stronger than him. Uh, it, it's funny. I didn't. Uh, I, I had, as I said before, I never planned to write that character at all. Um, um, but she just kept coming back. You, I mean, Quentin literally. Quentin would turn around, and then there she would be, and she'd be like, "You're gonna, you're gonna deal with me." Um, and then in the the second book. Uh, well, I, th I thought I should give her a chapter, maybe, in which she could explain what she had been up to in, in the first book, because it was a big plot hole. Uh, and when I started writing in her voice, I mean, it just, it just took off. And I realized, yes, yeah, somebody had to, um, I don't know, fill out the other half of the universe. We needed somebody who could describe Quentin, uh, for starters, describe him from outside and let us know how other people saw him, but also just um, show that he'd actually lived a pretty charmed life. Um, and uh, there was a m much darker path that a lot of people went on, and uh, we sort of had to honor those people too. I had a question about the, the magician's king, the magi magician king, and it has a really interesting structure because you have Quentin's stories moving forward at sort of real time, and interdispersed you have the this sort of B storyline of Julia yeah. that's sort of that took place before and catches up later on. How how did you write that? Did you plot them out? Did you write them out? And then reshuffle them, or did you actually write them out concurrently, and just they just ended up where they ended up? That experience was terrifying <coughs> because I I I, I didn't um, I tend to write books in a fairly simply chronological way. The, the way that people play with structure and flashbacks and things like that doesn't come naturally to me. So um, uh, when I when I realized that I was writing in this kind of interleaved st structure, um, it just gave me fits. Um, and there were a lot of post-its on the wall where I was trying to figure out where everything fit, fit together. It was definitely, it was, it was a new kind of writing for me and it, and it was done improvisationally. Um, I didn't plan it out particularly uh, in advance. <laughs> the whole Julia character, by the way, came out of my um, probably misplaced affection for Dudley Dursley, who is uh, <laughs> Harry Potter's cousin. I always felt that, that, that Dudley had kind of a raw deal. Um, because I knew that uh, if I, if, if, if my sort of little puke of a cousin who was living with me, I suddenly found out this, that this wretch, you know, had been admitted to a school for magic where he got to learn how to do magic and eat magic food that was delicious uh, and all that, um, I would have, it would have driven me nuts. I would have <laughs> just sat there brooding and thinking, God, why him and not me? Dudley actually doesn't do that to his credit. Um, but I always I, I I started thinking a lot about what it would feel like to be left behind um, in that way, uh, and oddly enough, 
on the one occasion where I met J.K. Rowling, I um, brought this theory up, brought up this theory with her, um, and asked her if she didn't feel she'd been a little hard on Dunley Dursley. <laughs> <laughs> again, I can tell you her answer because it consisted of two words, and the words were. Oh, please. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going <laughs> to, Joe and I will agree to disagree about that. So what, what house would you place Quinton in at Hogwarts? Oh, he's a Ravenclaw. <laughs> Pretty much the entirety of Breakbills would fit inside Ravenclaw, I think. Um, that's their, they, they favor that, that type. Um, earlier on, you mentioned uh, Lewis and Tolkien, and then you mentioned uh, George Martin and um, and Neil Gaiman and Susanna Clark, and you mentioned Fritz Leiber yeah. briefly, and I was wondering if there were other writers of that sort of, of Leiber's era, that sort of between the, those classics and the newer generation of writers that were influential on you, or and or you might recommend to readers of your own books. Yeah, uh, well, the other one, uh, sort of obviously, is Michael Moorcock. Um, I'd, I'd, I'd love to see people uh, rediscovering the Elwood books, um, uh, which in a lot of ways were this kind of radical critique of epic fantasy, um, kind of a satire of it, really, um, uh, long before Martin did it. Uh, he would, he's the one who, who springs to mind. Um, and I guess Le Guin is a little later than them, um, but you know, before the, uh, the, the wave of the 90s, she was a major, major influence on me. Um, as a fantasy writer who was American, uh, who was a woman, uh, who wasn't um, overtly Christian. Um, she was a major discovery for me, too. Those are the ones that come to mind. Uh, <clears throat> the three books are like very, uh, they each have very distinct storylines, but they're also very interconnected between the three of them. So I'm curious how much you knew about like book two and three when you started the first one. Well, when I was writing The Magicians, uh, I, I mentioned it, it took me a while, about well, five years. I, you know, I, uh, I was in the um, period of my career um, where um, in order to sell a book to a publisher, I had to write the whole thing. Sometimes you hear about people writing a great proposal, a couple sample chapters, they send it off to a publisher, the publisher says, great, here's the money, write the book. I had to write the whole book and then approach publishers. So when I was writing The Magicians, uh, it's, it's what, it seemed so weird to me what I was doing. I had, and I, and I really lacked a lot of confidence as a writer. I, I wasn't really that sure that the book would be published. And I, as a result, I never thought about later books. All I thought about, it would be like to jinx it, if I had even were to fantasize about what the sequels to this book that I was writing that would never be published were going to be. All I could think about was the, was the one book. I didn't start, you know, sort of weaving in that, that whole, uh, complicated arc um, until really after The Magicians was published. Um, and uh, all I can say I was, I was, I was surprised how easily it came together. Um, there seemed to be, once I put, once I started going back to The Magicians, there seemed to be a lot of actually dangling threads, a lot of blank space to fill in. Um, I was surprised, I'm still surprised, um, that it was able to come together uh, in that way since I didn't particularly plan it and I didn't plan the third book as I was writing the second. Um, uh, somehow the logic of it just um, kept kept churning until it was all, until it was all done, um, uh, and I got I think I got lucky in a few ways uh, as well um, uh, with the Alice thing in particular. Yeah. We back. Uh, quick comment. I'm a big. I, I like the idea that they're finished, and I like that there are loose ends or ends that are sort of halfway tied off with a throwaway line. Um, <laughs> once comes to mind, but it's spoilery. Um, in the third book, there's sort of one line that sort of might tie off a plot line from book two that was left dangling. But um, my question, kind of going back to the Quentin as Holden Caulfield, yeah. and also with the depression bit, did it get more difficult over time because Quentin? makes the same mistakes more than once, which is not at all like a heroic fantasy type where like you make a mistake and then you never make that mistake again. And uh, did it get frustrating writing that? Or was it more in line with the sort of depressive character that you do make the same mistake more than once, slightly differently? Yeah, well, um, I wouldn't say I was trying to make a point about it exactly, but 
Uh, yeah, uh, I, I, a, a lot of times I feel like you see in, in, in fantasy, a lot, uh, especially coming of age fantasy, um, you have the, the person and then they come of age and then they are of age. Uh, whereas, in fact, I've often found that um, I, I've, I've had to, I, I've, I've, I've learned a lesson and then forgotten it and had to relearn it over and over again. It, I just tried to give them sort of what I felt like was the texture psychologically of a real life. Uh, which is sort of messy that way. Um, I, I believe many commenters on Amazon found it frustrating. <laughs> uh, but I didn't find it frustrating. It just seemed like, it just seemed like realism to me. Um, but yeah, he, is a, he, he was a slow learner, as I don't know, a lot of people are. How are we doing for time? Probably a couple more questions. Okay. Yeah, I, I thought one thing was really interesting was how you have this school that taught magic and then you have this underground world of magic where people were learning magic and Julie became in a way much more sort of even better at magic than the people who went to Breakfields. And I wonder if you mentioned Dudley, but if that was a response to um, Harry Potter as well, where the magicians there kind of live in a Stalinist world where you can only become a magician if you go to the appropriate schools and if you go against the laws of their society or put into the Siberian jail. Um, or if there are any other magic systems or fantasy books that inspired you to think differently about magic and how magic's taught and created and learned. I was thinking probably mostly about, about the Honorverse and how it's set up. Um, uh, I thought a lot about, well, if you moved, if you, if you transplanted the Honorverse to America, which actually Rowling, it turns out, is doing. Um, uh, but I thought if you put them in, if you put them, put the put the magic school in America, it would be yeah, it would be much less sort of, uh, much less sort of feudal, much less sort of about this sort of in inherited aristocracy. Um, you'd have to, instead, you know, it would be all about taking some horrific like magic SAT, where you had to you know ascertain your aptitude, um, and uh, you know the lines would would get messy. Um, the line between muggles and wizards is. Pretty tidy. It's a pretty tidy line, with some exceptions. Um, but I felt like the longer I looked at the, my own world that I'd set up, I thought, God, they could never contain this. You know, it, some of it would bleed out, uh, and there would be a kind of chaotic gray area. Um, uh, and I, after a while, and at first I was like, oh, I don't even want to think about the gray area. But then I got very interested in the gray area and what life in it would be like. It is your favorite color, after all. It, <laughs> it is right. Um, uh, uh, so yeah, I, I sort of wanted to uh, to, to go into it um, uh, because yeah, it was one of those. Whenever you see a line in, in, in a book that is neat, um, you ha you start thinking about well, what if it were messy? Um, uh, yeah, and I got very interested in the question. It was definitely uh, more than anything else a response to the to the, the Harry, Harry Potter world. What do Harry Potter fans think of your books? Do you have any idea of of that? <coughs> I don't know. Some of them like him. <laughs> I, I don't. I mean, Harry Potter has this really big established fandom, and I, I wasn't sure if they, if they had sort of latched onto your books as they have gotten older or anything like that. Some have, yeah. I mean, as I mentioned, I, I spend some time in in the fandom. Uh, I, I go to some events and um, uh, I talk to them online. Um, I worried, I guess, when the first book came out, that um, uh, a lot of Harry Potter fans would be uh, offended. Um, then I started reading Harry Potter fan fiction um, <laughs> and discovered that what I had done to the Potterverse was very, was, was, was pale and weak and very uncreative compared to uh, the things that were being done um, by the fans. So, uh, you know, it was sort of, um, uh, it, 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 it shouldn't have surprised me that, that, that people were interested in what I was doing. Um. I didn't actually give any of these off. Do you want to try a little bit of trivia, see if any can stump anybody? <laughs> um, what, like uh, um, well, you're the Break Bills yeah. trivia? Yeah. Well, we, we can try to stump you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's the definitive. I'm pretty Whatever he says, he can just <laughs> claim it was in the background somewhere. <laughs> yeah, um, uh, yeah um, I don't know. First person who can name two of the unique beasts of Villery. Ember and Umber. They're actually not unique beasts. Uh, I don't consider them part of that, that crew. Uh, hmm. Questing beast is one. Not a unique beast. I don't know what it is. The seeing hair. Yes, there we go. Closing horse. 
Those here is not a unique beast. Now I think seeing here a quest of beast. I think we I, I think we have a winner. <laughs> That's, I think we'll wrap it up there. Is there one last question? Anybody have? Well, I saw hands earlier. Yeah, I already asked one, but did you get his disillusion? Did you get dis his disillusion with Narnia as Quentin does with Fillory? <laughs> no, probably not. As <laughs> I, I, I remain a friend of Narnia. Um, I, I once one of the. the Many sort of little <coughs> events that led to my getting to writing the magicians was uh, a, a chance encounter I had uh, with Philip Pullman. I mean, it was a chance. I worked hard, very hard to engineer this encounter. <laughs> <laughs> it appeared random to him. <laughs> <laughs> but we talked about C.S. Lewis because uh, he is a he 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 doesn't like C.S. Lewis. He'll really rant about C.S. Lewis. Um, uh, uh, he's very angry about Lewis. Uh, I have some problems with Lewis, some serious problems, but I also really love the Narnia book still. I have complicated feelings. Um, and one of the things that sort of spurred the magicians was almost this idea of kind of writing them, imagining if Lewis was reading them, and thinking, well, you know, I really love Narnia, but I also want to talk to you about some things that I feel it did not prepare me for adequately. <laughs> uh, but I, 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 I remain pretty in love with Narnia and can still reread those books. Except for the silver chair, I can never get to that. <laughs> Good. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you. Thank you.